talk about the optical response of the quantum material family. Uh, cobalt and nickel, calcogenides. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, sulfides. Sulfides. Yeah, that's. Uh, Are they calcogenides? I have no idea. I'm not a chemist. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so 30 minutes. Okay, thank you, Marcelo. I, I would like first to thank the organizers, Carol, Marcelo, Valber, and Teresa for getting me here. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. I have never been here before. Not in Sao Paulo. I have been to Sao Paulo several times, but never to, to ICTP. And uh, this will be a little bit of a change of what you saw in the previous days that every theoretical point that I'm going to approach here is probably wrong. Not that it's wrong. It's right, but I'll say it wrong, right, because of my utter incompetence on the, on the field. But this is an experimental talk, and uh, I want to, to look at this family here of barium cobalt sulfide and barium nickel sulfide, which has existed for a, for a long time, and of course, as most materials that we, we know today, they have existed for a long time, but now we understand their properties, and we see that those things that were pretty lame in the past are quite interesting now, okay? So, uh, oh, let, let me, of course, let me give credit who did, who, to the people who did the work, which of course not myself. So there is, this is the experimental data measured in most by a postdoc, a former postdoc of mine, David Santos Cotin. And uh, there is the theory people, Luca de Medici and Michele Casula, who did uh, all the calculations, the DFT, the DMFT, less conventional DMFT. Uh, people who grew the samples, uh, which are David also, Yannick Klein and Andrea Gauzi from Sorbonne University. And I also have a collaboration. I'm not going to show the data here because I don't have the time. Milan Orlita from the High Magnetic Field Lab in Grenoble and we have some uh, magnetic field data on this, but it's not exactly what I'm going to talk here, and Anna Krapp, who is involved also in the infrared portion of it. Okay. So uh, I want to start with a crash course on optical conductivity, and uh, I can look at optical conductivity as a general case of, let me quote, scattering of light. It's not really scattering. You're preserving everything so you don't scatter anything. Okay, but essentially you have a, a source that emits a photon that gets in a black box that does whatever you want to it, it does the spectral resolution, measures the sample, and you detect uh, the photon that, that gets out of that black box. And of course I just noticed that my arrows are pointing to the wrong direction. Okay. So reverse it. It's, it's the drama of moving from Linux to Windows and back and forth and open office to to Microsoft and these things. They claim that they are compatible. They're not. <laughs> but anyway, the particularity of infrared spectroscopy or optical conductivity, and the distinction here is that infrared spectroscopy is infrared. To do optical spectroscopy, and I'll see, I'll show it later, you have to measure much more than infrared. You have to go to the visible, to the UV, to the microwaves, so it's a little bit broader. But the particularities is first, it's a momentum averaged technique. Some people call it center of zone. It's not exactly true. It's mostly a delta k equals zero technique. And uh, as opposed, for instance, to, to uh, photoemission or to RICS, where you will, or neutron scattering, where you will uh, probe at different k's in the, in the brilliant zone. It's an elastic, and, and I put here a quote, scattering, in the sense that the measurement of the frequency of the photon getting out is at the same frequency of the photon getting in as opposed, for instance, to Raman. Raman, you send a photon in, and you measure a photon out at a different frequency. You measure a shift. Here, you don't measure shifts. You measure at the same, at the same uh, uh, frequency. It is, and I'll get more to this, a broadband or white light spectroscopy. This is both a gift and a curse. Okay? It's a fantastic possibility because it allows you to look at the whole spectral range and see how things move around and where excitations existed and where do they go. It's a horrible thing because it's not easy to measure in a broadband. Okay? And uh, uh, I'm not going to discuss this here. Quite often we have to make up our data. Okay? You, you, 
you have to guess what would happen at very high frequencies and at very low frequencies. And it's necessary, and I'll show you, because of Kramer's chronic relations. That's how you get the optical functions here. And the final point is that it's an electric field measurement. So I'll show you some, some points on that. Me essentially, you're doing a transport measurement, a resistivity measurement at high frequencies. Okay? To give you an idea that it is a transport measurement, even though I'm not showing you here exactly this, this is a measurement on YBCO, one of the, the high TC cuprates, the one that has more paper, the most papers on it. This is the reflectivity, okay? So it always varies from zero to one. Detail here, optical conductivity is an absolute value technique, okay? The number that I give you, if I measured it right, is the number uh, that has some meaning. It's not like many of the spectroscopy techniques that you're looking at relative intensities instead of absolute intensities. Here we are talking about absolute intensities. The reflectivity goes from zero to one, and here you have a frequency scale in these horrible units of wave numbers. Many of the plots I'll show have EVs. It's not much better, but more understandable. So a wave number is the inverse of the wavelength. And to give you an idea, 8,000 wave numbers is one electron volt. Or 100 wave numbers is 100 microns. Take your pick on the unit you prefer. But I'll get back to this. But essentially here, what, what you're looking at here is the same material. It's YBCO. And it's exactly the same sample. And it's exactly the same orientation. The difference between the two is that, if you look carefully here, you have 07 minus an epsilon, and here you have 06 plus an epsilon. So I just annealed the sample to take oxygen out. And when you do that, you take the free carriers out, and you go from a metal up here to an insulator down here. So uh, I'm not going to enter into the details here, but what you're seeing here, the peaks here are optically active phonons. So you see the lattice vibrations. And when you put, they're all uh, uh, polar vibrations, so they split the charge. They put plus and minus separate. And when you put charge carriers in the system, those carriers will start compensating that dipole. And the phonons go away. And eventually you have just this blanketing of all the phonons, this screening of all the phonons. You can still see a small peak here, okay? But it's just uh, 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 very close to 100% reflectivity. Even it's a little bit faked here by the log scale, okay? But it's very high reflectivity. Uh, and, and that's essentially what you see every morning when you brush your hair or when you brush your teeth or when, when you shave, you're looking at this thing here called the plasma frequency, okay? You're looking at that plasma frequency in your mirror. So every metal should reflect a lot of light up to a certain frequency called the plasma frequency proportional to the square uh, of the carrier density in the system, okay? So this is to show that uh, optical conductivity is an uh, 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 electrical measurement. Uh, let me formalize this just a little bit with a very new theory, very sophisticated, called Maxwell equations, but you can get all from it, and I probably am getting it wrong. So uh, you just get the Maxwell equations, and you put two small, if you just use them, and everybody does this in an undergrad course, you just put in vacuum, you get a wave equation. If you assume a plane wave, that's the format you have for the propagation of electromagnetic radiation in vacuum. Now, if you assume that you have a, a material, a conducting material for the matter, you have to get back to the current density. And to do that, we use Ohm's law. Okay, so the current density is the, opt, is the conductivity, the electrical conductivity. And that's, we call, that's what we call the optical conductivity because of the optical frequencies you're measuring it. But it's exactly the same thing if you go to zero frequency as the resistivity of the material, the inverse resistivity, uh, uh, times the electric field. And when you, if you do the same solution, you will find a very similar equation. But what you see is that the speed of light of propagation has been renormalized by this factor. OK? And this renormalization is all that you need to know to be able to analyze your optical data. Basically, it's saying that this renormalization is called, by definition, refraction index is how much the speed of light decreases in the material. And you can relate it to the dielectric function or the optical conductivity. All these things are the same thing, okay? So uh, if I now go to a, to a real case, what I measure is the reflectivity up here, okay? 
This is related to the refraction index. So if I can get the refraction index out of the reflectivity, I can get everybody. Now, to do that, we do uh, what's called causality relations or kramer kronig And uh, to do that, I, I develop this equation a little bit to get the real part and an imaginary part. And from Cauchy's theorem, I know that in an analytical function, blah, 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 mathematical people will say you a lot of th things that I just ignore and assume they are right. Uh, the real and imaginary parts are related by what's called Hilbert transformations. And then you use kramer kronig which allows you to go from zero to infinity instead of minus infinity to plus infinity. But essentially, you can calculate this phase by integrating the logarithm of the reflectivity. And that's the point at all frequencies. That's why I have to measure from zero to infinity. Okay? That's where the broadband kicks in. Uh, of course, we don't measure from zero to infinity. I can get pretty close to zero here in my reflectivity. I can get very far from infinity here, okay, by definition. And then I have to guess what happens. So we have models, we have understanding of the material to see how things go very high in frequency and very low. Can we do that properly? The answer, a piece of an answer is here. So this is for the same material here, ellipsometry data. Ellipsometry is a technique that measures directly the, uh, the complex optical functions. So that, these are the dots they have here. The problem of ellipsometry is that it's a technical problem. It cannot go very low in frequency, especially in very special cases, using synchrotron facilities and using complicated materials. It's not a tabletop experiment to go very low in frequencies. The solid line is the Kramer's chronic from that day. So if you know what you're doing, you can be safe. There has been a debate for a long time. Oh, Kramer's chronic cheats with your data. You're not going to get the right thing. It's false. You can do it. Okay, so that's a, a, a false debate. Uh, to analyze the data in a material, we use another recent sophisticated model called the Druda model, published exactly in the 1900s. Okay, it's one of Druda was famous for his model and for being the editor of Einstein's paper in, in the Annals of Physics. And essentially, the Druda model, you all know, it's free electrons. Uh, uh, no electron correlation, so it's just uh, scattering of electrons, elastic scattering. And you have an average time, that I depict here by tau, between collisions. And once you have that, you can calculate what would be the dynamic response of the material. And for, for what matters to us here is the sigma, is the complex optical conductivity. So uh, if you start from this reflectivity, you can get this from the Duda model and you look at the complex optical conductivity here, what you're gonna see is a zero frequency Lorentzian peak. Okay? So this is the Druda model. If there's one message you, you have to take from, from optical spectroscopy here is this picture here on the bottom. Okay, if you're on a party drinking champagne and talking to people and somebody, hey, you don't know anything about optical spectroscopy, you say, yes, I do. A zero frequency centered peak is free carriers, a finite frequency is bound carriers. And then they're just going to look stupid. You're also going to look stupid by talking about the Druda model drinking champagne, but that's a different story. <laughs> anyway, so this is essentially the thing. When you look at spectrum, finite frequency peak means a bound carrier. A phonon is a bound carrier. It's a dipole. Okay, a polar is a bound carrier. Uh, interband transition is a bound carrier. And the free carry is zero frequency. Okay? And we all love the optical conductivity because of this F sum rule. Okay, the F sum rule states that the integral of the real part of the optical conductivity at all frequencies from zero to infinity is a constant depending only on uh, 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 universal constants, the electron charge, mass, and the number of electrons. Technically, it's the total number of electrons divided by their mass plus the total number of protons divided by their mass. There's a factor 2,000. We cannot measure that factor 2,000 between them. We just ignore the protons. So the point here is all electrons in the material. We are not talking about conducting electrons. It's all of them. If you integrate from zero to infinity, you have to take all of them into consideration. And this is a constant. Then you're going to say, well, that is stupid. Of course, you integrate to zero to infinity, it's a constant. But it's a constant that doesn't depend on any exterior parameter. You change the temperature on the material, that constant remains the same. 
You have a phase transition. That constants remain the same. You put pressure, you put magnetic field. Magnetic field is a little bit trickier, but that constant stays the same. Okay? So this is the F sum rule, and this is an example here of a practical application. This is a material, a, 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 a phosphorus bronze here, and uh, phosphorus tungsten 14050. Uh, the optical conductivity here as a function of frequency and oof, I put electron volts on the top there so you can follow it better. And uh, at higher temperatures, you have this red decreasing profile here. There's some structure, there are phonons, there are other things. But essentially, it's not a drew the profile, but it sort of remembers it. Remember, zero frequency centered peak, free carriers. Okay, so that's a zero frequency centered peak. You go below, uh, I think 140, yes, 140, a little bit below that. It has a charge density wave transition. You deplete states at the Fermi level. Okay, and when you do that, uh, your optical conductivity is the conductivity. If you take states out, the resistivity increases. The optical conductivity must decrease. Okay? There's no question about that. So you're going to lose optical conductivity here at low frequencies. You open a gap, but the sum rule says this cannot go anywhere. It has to reappear here. Okay? So you have this transfer of spectral weight. This is the workhorse of optical spectroscopy. You can explain many, many things on this. You can explain ferroelectricity. You can explain superconductivity, at least the response. You can explain semiconductors. Everything comes from some version of this summary. So this is what you should remember. So uh, I took already this time. Let me go to what I want to talk. Otherwise, I will not have time to, to show you what's interesting here. Uh, I'm going to look at materials that are related to Dirac materials. So I'm just going to point out this thing here. Uh, this is a calculation. Uh, by these people here, uh, what happens with the optical conductivity in a system that has symmetric bands, depending on a power law, touching at a one point, a semi-metal, okay? And they find that the optical conductivity is very simple, is the frequency to a power depending on the dimensionality of the system divided by the power law coefficient, okay? So examples, graphene. So graphene, just look, this is as a function of electric field. So essentially, graphene is a flat conductivity, constant, because dimensionality is 2, minus 2, 0. Optical conductivity does not depend on frequency. Now, if you have uh, 3D uh, Dirac cones, you will have dimensionality. Uh, so Z is always 1 here, but it's 3 minus 1. It's a linear conductivity. And this has been claimed to be the signature of Dirac cones. Then if you complicate things, you put a gap in the Dirac cones, you shift the linear behavior to a little bit above, you open a gap here in the conductivity. Or if you put more than one Dirac cone, two kinds, you can have different linear behaviors. Okay. So based on this, I'll get to my material, which is the barium cobalt sulfide, claimed to be a moth insulator, strongly correlated, anti-ferromagnetic phase, going all the way to the nickel sulfide claimed to be a regular metal, none of which is actually true. Um, and let me see what happens with this. The, the, the history of that, so this is the re resistivity as a function of temperature. The cobalt compound is here. The nickel compound is here. There is some old reflectivity data. So here you see sort of a more insulating system in the cobalt peaks here, which are phonons, and going to that kind of very high reflectivity metallic response. Uh, if you look at the optical conductivity, then you have this thing here for the cobalt, which is kind of linear. And nobody looked at this much closer than that in the 90s, uh, late 90s or early 2000s when this was measured. So we took back the two end members here, the cobalt and the nickel. So the reflectivity at room temperature probably here, this one. This is uh, the cobalt. So it has the phonons that you look at an insulator, but it has this decreasing profile, which is not an insulator. So it's not really an insulator. It's really horrible metal. Now you have the, the nickel, which has a very high conductivity, but then there's this dip here that we have no clue where it comes from. So it's not very conventional on, on any of them. If you go to the optical conductivity, then you see this linear dependence here to very high frequencies. And then you see the, the Judah-like peak, but then you see a bump. Quick remark here, just because it works. If you calculate the difference 
of the area between the two. You integrate sigma one for the two curves and you make the difference and you use the proper renormalization constants, you find that the difference in the area is 0.9 electrons, or for an experimentalist, one electron. That's exactly what happens. Nico is putting another electron in. Okay, so it works. We're so happy when things work. End of parenthesis. Okay. So uh, we, we start here on bearing cobalt. Okay, so this is the temperature dependence. Uh, you see at higher temperatures in red that you have the phonons and this decreasing profile. And when you cool down, the phonon gets deeper and sharper. It's because electrons are going away. So it's sort of a semiconducting behavior. You have more electrons in the conduction band and they're going down. Okay. Quantitatively, uh, qualitatively, that's what you would say. And if you look at the optical conductivity, then you're going to see some features. You see the phonons here. Then you see uh, a small bump here that we can discuss, but that's not the point. But you see this linear behavior, which extends for a very broad range. Okay? And this, people have claimed all the time, oh, you see linear behavior. It's direct physics. It's or vial physics. Optics will not really, uh, zero magnetic field optics will not make any distinction between Dirac and vial physics. So uh, we, we are, we have no personality. We said, OK, it's linear, it's Dirac. <laughs> Let's go for it. And, and, and because you, you can see here that the linear behavior at high temperatures go all the way down, but at low temperatures they cut here, we say there is a small gap in the system. So we are going to analyze the data using this approach here. Okay? You have a linear dispersion, you have a gap. And uh, I didn't put the equation here. But this is my data. This is the fit with zero parameters. What you need here to do this fit is the Fermi velocity. You can grab it from other data. Electronic, uh, electronic band structure calculation should, should tell you. If you yes. Are to Wait for the next slide. <laughs> because we are happy and we are, well, let's write the paper. Until photo emission and electronic people calculations came to be party poopers. Okay? That's the whole point because this is nice, but this is wrong. And it's wrong. Now there is photo emission. And now you have to look with the eyes of the fate. So band structure calculations, uh, strongly correlated on Michele Cazula, and, uh, uh, will give you this kind of band structures here. The, they do have sort of a cone-like shape linear dispersion here, but it's 1 EV below EF. And if you believe in this is quite insulating, so photo emission, you have to look with the eyes of the fate. But if you know the answer, you might envision that there are some states there, but not up there, not in the Fermi level. So it might work as well as you want. It's false. And, and that, uh, that's the inverse of what Feynman said. Feynman said, if your theory is wonderful but doesn't fit data, it's wrong. Well, if your data is wrong, wonderful but doesn't fit theory here, in this case, it's wrong. Right? So unfortunately, I have to say that. Uh, so it cannot be it. So what it is? The data is right, actually. It's just the interpretation is wrong. Uh, I'll get back to this. In the nickel, this cone moves upwards to the Fermi level and will be important. So this is wrong. We tried. Uh, and the answer is the, 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 the result is less pretty than just the plain vanilla cones. Okay? But we can explain it. So the alternative is to say, can we get linear conductivity from correlations? Okay? And this is the calculation that Michele Cazula did. Uh, there is a detail here. That he does what is called dynamic U. Instead of just putting a, a constant Coulomb repulsion, he puts a frequency-dependent Coulomb repulsion. Both would work. The frequency dependent works better. Okay. Uh, and if you have weak or no correlations, you do get uh, density of states, which is very high at the Fermi level. So this should be a metal. Uh, and when you add the correlations, you're strongly depleting this here. You're opening a gap. And you keep a small peak here uh, to, do the, to, 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 to handle the Julia. There are some other consequences. You have an orbital reshuffle here. That's the microscopic origin of what's happening. Uh, I won't enter into the details here, but you can understand it very well on the orbital occupation uh, of what's happening. OK, so if you look at the optical conductivity, is it good? Well, it's better, but no correlation. The data is the red one. Okay? No correlation gives you the Druda, so it's the blue one. And with correlation, there are two calculations here. Here, there's a finite lifetime added by hand in the, in, the add, in the light blue one. 
no finite lifetime, the green one's not very different. So you can say, well, yeah, okay, it sort of works, but not as well as I would expect, but okay, I can live with that. Okay? And then I did, uh, I asked our theorists to do the thing that they look up to you and say, you cannot do that. I said, can we tweak your calculations and make it work? Okay? So uh, the idea here was the following. This is the density of states. And what I see, when I see this density of states, I see a peak here that I can put a delta function. I see another peak here for the Drew that I can see a delta function. And I see a background below uh, EF. So I said, can you just forget your calculations, take your background and put two delta functions there and let's play with those two delta functions. And when you do that, just by shifting the positions here of, of this gap, you get exactly the data. So we are massaging the, uh, the MFT. Okay? The MFT, people hate that. It's, it's hardly predictable, sir. Yes, it's hardly predictable, but it works. Okay? Uh, to the point that the referee said, you cannot put this in the paper. We took it out and put in the supplementary material. Okay? Uh, but not only that, now if you uh, uh, create a small gap with, that we see experimentally there, you can also fit the low frequency data. Okay? So the, 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 the idea here is that you can describe the linear optical conductivity from first principles just by adding correlation. Linear optical conductivity is no longer a, a, a field only related to, a Fermi, to Dirac physics. Okay, so, uh, well, this is just to show that the numbers work fine. So now let me jump to the other end, to the nickel compound. And when I jump to the other end, I calculate the optical conductivity here. So you do have a Druda-like peak that, uh, with, a, with a sharpening at low frequency, at low temperatures, that's very high. And then you have this linear behavior here. And generally, I showed you the, the tungsten bronze. And uh, the tungsten bronze uh, shows you um, that when you have the spectral spectra weight, they cross at a point. That's called an isosbastic point. Here you have a different thing. You have an isosbastic line. This is not seen anywhere else. Where is it coming from? Okay? And you transfer spectral weight from below here to all the way up here. And we are want to relate that to the linear dispersions that now photoemission sees and also band structure calculation at the Fermi level. Okay? So what we did, we did the same game. Uh, no DMFT needed here. This is essentially not very correlated. So uh, you don't need to add a lot of, uh, there, there was no correlation added. So there's no correlation added. You get some small uh, density at the Fermi level, but you get a finite, well-defined density. Uh, this is the data. This is the calculation by adding by hand a lifetime uh, to, to describe temperature. And because we, don't, we didn't add any correlations, you're going to see that the peak here is not at the same energy, but this could be corrected just by adding a little bit of correlations. Okay? Correlations will renormalize frequencies to the lower end, always. That, that's uh, our established thing. So say, OK, good. We can explain this by, by first principles. Can we do better than that? Okay, I keep bugging these theories to, to do, hey, can we massage our data? And uh, this was a good massage, more acceptable. So the idea here is, can we get more information on the DMFT by selectively integrating the regions of K-space? Okay, so this is the, 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 the Fermi surface of the material. And we can say, hey, if I integrate everything, I have my curve. But if I integrate only around these positions that have specific uh, uh, characteristics, what can I see? Okay? And we chose several of them. So, uh, the point is that the full calculation is here, but if you uh, calculate only uh, around the Dirac cones, all of a sudden you see that this dispersion here gets flat. Okay? And you have the peak here. The peak here is the Van Hove singularity. Eventually the band turns up and down, and you have a Van Hove singularity, you have the peak. But that, that linear dispersion, which could be a 3D cone, all of a sudden shows, no, it's a 2D cone. You have a Dirac physics, which is a plain vanilla Dirac physics. Now, if you look at other positions, you can start separating everything, every, every, every contribution of the optical conductivity. 
And, and the bottom line is, by doing that, you can identify the Van Hove singularity, you can identify the conic, and you can identify the Druda peak. Okay, you can see which band does what in everything. Okay? So uh, I think I might have mine, but according to my computer, I only have 35 seconds. Yeah. So uh, I'll use my last 35 seconds. Uh, the, the point here, the three messages that I, uh, I wanted to tell you is uh, for, for a while, linear conductivity meant Dirac or biophysics. That's not true. And after that paper, there are many examples showing that it's not. Okay. Uh, don't trust just the data without analyzing it more closely. Uh, you can get, you can explain everything in the uh, conducting material including this isosbastic line, which is essentially just the protected Dirac states. Okay? You cannot do anything. They're all filled. There are no possible states there. So transfer of spectral weight has to get to the closest empty state, and it's not the Dirac states that are blocking that. And the question here is that you have, uh, oh, there's one picture missing here, but that's not a problem. I mentioned that you have sort of linear dispersion, one EV below. Uh, um, the Fermi level, uh, and that goes to the Fermi level when you get to the nickel. In between, you will go to a regular Druda model. So this is the open question that we have now. How do you move from that sort of incipient Mott insulator, that reasonably correlated Mott insulator, to this not very well correlated uh, uh, Dirac compound going through a regular Druda? And that we don't know yet. Okay? So, uh, that's what I had to, to, to tell you. I was hap very happy to be here, and thank you very much. Okay, so we are now open for questions. Eduardo? Okay, I'll speak loud. Uh, so, regarding the cobalt, uh, I understand that some strong correlations could be weakly correlated metal yeah. or the very narrow Yeah, the, the weak, yeah. And then somehow it explains the data. But what's not clear is what aspect of strong correlations led to, to, to the final answer to the conductivity. Is it just the position of the quasi-particle peak and the, the, high, the, the incoherent high energy stuff? Or, for instance, is there um, uh, lifetime facts coming in that are leading to that linear behavior? It, 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 it's not clear what okay. aspect of the strong correlation is leading to the linear conductivity in that case. Yes. Um, the, the weakly correlated material, it gives you a very high density of states here. Okay? So uh, what the correlations do is to give you a semi-metal behavior, almost. Okay? It doesn't create a full gap, so it's not a really gap to give you a almost quadratic optical conductivity. What, what about the position of the peak? The position of this peak here? Yeah. That will control, that's, that's what the referee prevented me from showing, right? But does it depend on the dynamic field? Yes. So you need the dynamic field? No, uh, yes and no. Okay, so, the, the, so let, let me answer that and I'll get back to this. Okay. So the, the point is, if you, if you, the correlations will deplete the states here, and we'll give you, it's not a really fully, but you see that here uh, you have an almost linear density of states, on the, on between 0 and 0.5 EV. Okay. I, I disagree, because here your yeah. energy scale is from 0 to 0 0.3. Yeah. And you're talking about something that is... No, 0 to 0 0.5 here. So everything has to happen around 0. Yeah, here. I would expect a small Drude from that small peak. And yes. I don't see it there. It's, well, it, it is here, right? Your, your conductivity doesn't go to zero. So uh, the problem is, you can imagine this, there is this linear component here, and the Druda would just do this here. So if you add the two, that's what you get. You can do that, you can fit it by that. Way. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you're saying that the linear thing comes from the form of the density of states that yes. you go? Oh. Yes. Okay. But that's the, the, the linear things come from the depletion of states and very close to the Fermi level, as Marcelo said. Here I'm going from 0.5 EV to plus 0.5 EV. This is the region that is really playing the role here. It, it's hard to imagine that the very nice linear behavior comes from a sort of a special 
Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's okay. No, we can talk yeah. later. So, so let, let me just get here. So uh, the, the dynamic U, it works also with the static U. The problem is that you have to put a static U of 6 EV, and the dynamic U, the zero value dependence will be, uh, I, I think I have the picture here, 3 EV or something like that. Yes, the, the reason why, why did they use, they could have just used the static U. Okay, the, uh, that's, okay that's, but so, why, yeah, they why this have, compound is so special for they, this? They, they could use the static requires U. requires the dynamic. Okay. The dynamic U will make work the other data, photo emission, uh, quantum oscillations, and everything else with the proper value at the DC value. So the dynamic U will lower the DC value of U, which controls those DC properties. I see, but they have a, a deeper explanation, I mean. Well, a deeper the, explanation for me is the same as uh, every material should be like that, but it doesn't need to be. It's just because the stronger U here dependence is like that. I would say uh, gold is a drew the metal. Actually, it's not. It should be a Fermi liquid with a quadratic scattering rate, but you don't need to put the quadratic scattering rate because it's very low. So I would get the same point here. Here it just gets more exacerbated. I see. And uh, what do you mean by the adding a little bit of correlations for the nickel compound? Well, uh, if, you, if you look what, at... Why do you think this might explain the, the position no, uh, the, of the No, the point peak? is, uh, here there's no correlation. So if you look at the energy values of the structure that we see, so the Van Hove singularity is measured at 0.4, and here it's calculated at 0 0.6, 0 0.65. Yeah. Okay? So when you add correlations, you're increasing the effective mass. I see. And when you increase the effective mass, we normalize the spectrum to lower energies. So if you add a little bit of correlations, we didn't try, uh, we should, uh, we could renormalize this to the right point. I see. Okay. So quantitatively, you would fit. I see. So the, what we call GW approximation might yeah. be better, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's recorded. Oh, so going back there, the calculation uh, is done with what type of, of, of solution of the MFT? I, 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 I said I knew that once. Yeah, because yeah. You, you explain. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Okay. So you, you, you gave us very good advice for us theories. Yeah. You've been experimentalist and saying what things we have to trust and not trust, yeah. the, the Kramer's chronic and all these things. But coming from theory, in the MFT there are also many things that you yeah. should be you know, I, I, I understand that there is an urge to, to explain experiments, yeah. but as Nosier said, a crazy theory that explains experiments yeah. remains a, cra a crazy yeah, theory. Of course. Yeah. Right? So I, I don't think that we, we, we have that level of, of accuracy in the calculation of the MFT to be able to draw that kind of. No, you don't. That, that, that's the result, right? The result, the level of accuracy is that you do get a sort of linear behavior, but you have a much lower uh, value with respect to the, to the data. So this, this is the plain calculation. Don't do anything to the calculation, you get that. Okay. So, but if I tweak the calculation a little bit, I can yeah. get it perfectly. So of course what I did is I changed the positions of the peaks that the calculation gives me. And then I fit the data that way. But you're absolutely right. You don't have that level of accuracy. Yeah. This is the true result. Yeah. Okay? And the essential message here is that you don't have the, the parabolic or, or the bumpy or whatever. You have a sort of smoothly, continuously increasing optical conductivity within the, the accuracy of the calculation. Okay. And you also have that experimentally. At and, a different and, level. What does the density functional theory gives you for the cobalt compound? I'll have to look at the paper. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. is it metallic? It's just like a regular metal. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. 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 No. Yeah. yeah. That's it. No correlations. It's that one. 
upper one, sorry. Okay. okay. Any I other question? I have a question, perhaps very quickly. Marcello. Yeah. It's about uh, if um, you have uh, perhaps wild semi-metals, you have also surface states. Yeah. Uh, is your technique able to assess that level, or mm -hmm. is the surface is too small uh, and will be hidden? Uh, it has been a discussion for a while. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't have a, an answer for the vial states. I have an answer for lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate, which is also the same surface only, right? And uh, there is one paper using ellipsometry at really grazing incidence that sees an effect at the level of 0.1% of the, 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 the measurement, okay? 0.1%. So, yeah. Yes. It's not impossible. Not impossible. And I can trust that result because of other things they show. It's everything compatible. But it's, it's, it's extremely difficult. The bulk will contaminate or will obscure everything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. More questions? So I, 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 uh, I have one no, last question. You, 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 at, at some point, you mentioned that the, the, from the reflectivity, the cobalt compound, yeah was sort of an insulator because you see the photons, but uh, not totally because it went down, yeah. right? Yeah. So what right. is the resistivity of this uh, material telling? Uh, it's, uh, it's here, right? So it will be uh, the, the nickel. Well, it doesn't logarithmic diverge here, but at room temperature, I don't know. Uh, well, let's put 10 milliamp centimeters. So mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not really zero. It's, it's, it's not good. But it's not that bad. Okay, so it, there is some some carriers, but you have uh, semiconducting behavior here, right? You have uh, I wouldn't call this a metal insulator transition because we don't see, but you have sort of a crossover. Uh, okay. Yeah, you have you have valid values for the conductivity. Okay. And uh, if you want to transfer that to optical conductivity, uh, you do get this is the low frequency, but you do get here. Uh, oh, come on, this one. Okay, so it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty low, so let's say 30 inverse ohm centimeters, while BCO is 10,000. Mm -hmm. Or oh, at room temperature, it's 3,000. Yeah. Okay, and, and gold and copper are 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. Very nice. Okay, so we can thank Ricardo again thank and move on.